The breath is like a mirror for the mind. Which means that if you want to see the mind clearly, you have to get the breath in good shape first. Let it settle down and be smooth and even. So if the mirror has a lot of bumps, it's going to be a distorting mirror. If it's a concave or a convex mirror, it's going to make you either look abnormally tall or abnormally short. So you want to have a mirror that's nice and flat and smooth. And then you look into the mirror and you see the mind. Because some of those ripples and wavelets in the mirror are actually coming from the mind. If the breath feels tight, sometimes it's a sign that there's a lot of tension in the mind. So you use the breath not only to reflect the mind, but also to have a good influence on the mind. Breathe in a way that feels really good. If you notice any tension anywhere in the body, allow it to relax, relax, relax. See how much of the body you can get smoothed out in this way. Whether you get the whole body or not right away doesn't really matter. Take what you've got and work with that first. Then gradually expand your range. And then take stock of what you've got. That's an important aspect of breath meditation, is looking at your own mind, gaining a sense of what's in there. When they talk about acceptance, the only way that really connects with breath meditation is to accept the fact that you've got what you've got. But you can't stop there. As the Buddha said, there are three things you can do with the mind. If you notice that it needs gladdening, you make you find a way to make it gladdened. If it needs steadying, you find a way to get it more steady. And if it's carrying around some burdens, you find a way to release it from its burdens. Those are the three main skills. Now, in some cases, you do this with the breath. If you can make the breath feel really full and really energizing the body. That can have a gladdening effect on the mind. We smooth the breath out, that can steady the mind. And again, when the breath feels really good, you find that there are certain thoughts that you're holding and you don't want to hold them anymore. You don't see any real point in holding them because the breath feels so good, you just rather be there with the breath. Because the mind does have this funny tendency. It can find some really heavy things to weigh itself down with, and yet it likes it. It likes to be weighed down. Get some sort of perverse satisfaction out of it. So you want to see what you can do to see past that and see that it really doesn't accomplish anything. You let it go. And as I said, sometimes working with the breath itself helps. Other times you have to think your way past this. This is what the Buddhist teachings on verbal and mental fabrication are all about. How to talk to yourself in such a way that you can get out of your mood. I saw a father one time working with his child. The child was cranky and crying. And the father started joking with him, and pretty soon the child was laughing, forgetting its bad mood entirely. It's a good skill to have, learning how to talk yourself out of a bad mood, how to gladden the mind. And there are various ways you can do this. You can think about the fact that you've got a really good dharma here to practice. And you've got the opportunity to practice the dharma. Who found this dharma? The Buddha. Someone who had everything, as they say, in terms of the values of society. Lots of wealth, lots of power, 
all kinds of pleasures. And he realized it wasn't good enough. So he sacrificed that and went off into the forest and found something of much greater value and came back and he taught everybody for free. It's hard to find people like that in the world. And then here we found the Dharma that was discovered by that sort of person. He sets a good example. And it's good to have that example in your life. There's so many people in the world out there who see nothing but other greedy people. Other people with bad intentions, and so they live with greed and bad intentions themselves. They have nothing to lift their sights. And the people actually who don't want to have their sights lifted, the story I was told recently about a retreat center. It's very touchy about having its behavior described in public. I've talked about it in public in the past, and without even mentioning its name, the teachers complain. But the latest one is that they had a retreat and it was on the factors for awakening. And at the end, someone asked one of the teachers about awakening, and the teacher said, I don't really believe in awakening. And half the students applauded. In other words, there, there's that part of the mind that would rather be told that there is nothing better than what you've got right now, because otherwise it, you feel that you've got to do something. You could be better than you are, and people don't like to be told that. They'd rather be, just be left thinking that what they've got is the best there is. That's a very strange, perverse way of thinking. There we do have the example of the Buddha. We don't think in those ways. That should be a source of gladness right there, that this is not as good as it gets. There's better. There's hope. And it's not empty hope. It's a genuine hope, a genuine possibility. So you think about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha as ways of giving yourself encouragement. The Sangha, of course, you can read the stories in the Tarikata and the Tarakata about all the monks and nuns who had lots of problems in their practice, and yet they were able to overcome them. As Venerable Ananda once said, you know, a good way to think about that is that they could do it. They were human beings. You're a human being. You can do it too. That thought can gladden the mind. You can think about your own Generosity, you can think about your own virtue, that you are a person with qu quality. You're not just a weight on the world. You have done good things in your life that you didn't have to. Generosity is generosity when it's free. In other words, when you give something not because it's Christmas or New Year's or somebody's birthday, but you give it because you want to give something. And you've done that. The same with virtue. There are times when you could have gotten away with harming someone else, but you didn't want to do it, simply on principle. Those are thoughts that can gladden the mind. Even the contemplation of death can be used to gladden the mind when you realize that the skills you're working on here are skills that you can use as you approach death, as you go through death and come out the other side. It's hard to find skills like this. So lots of different ways you can gladden the mind. So if you see that your mind is down on itself, and usually when you're down on yourself you get to be down on other people. And John Lee talks about that, how, how easy it is once you start oppressing yourself with bad moods. After all, you can't stand it any longer, and so you start throwing it outside. Or in a John Mahabu's image, you Start, you start by throwing mud at yourself, and then you get tired of that, and you take that mud and you throw it at other people. And there again, there's a kind of a perverse satisfaction in that, but it doesn't really accomplish anything. So the Buddha is giving you some skills, trying to gladden the mind. I've noted before that you read the Dharma talks, so a lot of the Ajans, and a huge percentage of them are pep talks. 
your mind that this is something really good that you're doing here, so that you can have that voice in your head to remind yourself, yes, you're doing something good, something worthwhile. You have worth as a person. You've got everything you need. And John Munn would talk to his monks, remember, this was back in the days when Thai peasants were not believed that they could accomplish anything. All the great accomplishments were supposed to be coming from Bangkok. So a lot of his Dharma talks reminded his, his followers, okay, you have what you need. You've got a body. You've got a mind. And that's all you need for awakening. It's just a matter of putting it to use. So these are some of the ways you can gladden yourself in the path. You steady yourself by realizing okay, that the other things you could be doing right now get you in a lot of trouble. One of the images they have in the canon is of a, of a tortoise. And there's a fox after the tortoise. He's found the tortoise. The tortoise is sitting there in its shell. And the tortoise knows that as soon as it extends any of its legs or its head, it's done for. The fox is going to bite him off. You go out after sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, your ideas about the past, your ideas about the future. There's trouble out there. As soon as you stick an arm or a leg or a head out in any direction, it's going to get bitten off. That's why the Buddha has so many teachings about the, the drawbacks of all the other places you could be sending your mind right now. To remind you, there really are dangers there. You can develop all kinds of unhealthy habits by letting your mind wander out there. Here you've got something good. So don't throw it away. Look after it. Stay right here. And since you gladden the mind and steady the mind, that right there can release you from a lot of, a lot of the unhealthy habits that you develop, that you have been developing outside the practice. And as you develop your discernment, you begin to realize that even within the concentration, there are layers and layers to be peeled away. You've got the mind ready to settle down. You've been using all your directed thought and evaluation with the breath and to deal again also with any disturbances or any distractions that come your way. Then when the mind hasn't had enough, okay, you can of those things, you can drop the directed thought and evaluation and just kind of plow down into the sensation of the breath and get yourself fixed right there. That takes a huge burden off the mind, just staying right here. Even the sense of fullness or rapture, that becomes something that eventually you want to get past. You want to focus on a more refined level of energy in the body. Then you find that even the need to pay attention to whether the breath is coming in or going out, that becomes a burden. So you just drop that and everything gets very, very, very still. Breath energy filling the body with no ripples or gaps. Everything is very smooth. That mirror you want becomes a very bright mirror and it's reflecting a very bright mind. To try to use the breath, both as a mirror and as also as a way of adjusting what you see in the mirror. Use your thoughts, use your perceptions in a skillful way to put the mind in the right mood. So it does have the energy to stay here and it has the willingness to be steady here. So it can let go, put down its burdens. There's so many things we carry around, even though they weigh us down. For some reason, we're unwilling to drop them. Like the man in the story who went with his friend to a village. The village had been abandoned. 
It had been abandoned so quickly that people just left a lot of their possessions in the village and ran off. And they find huge piles of flax, so they bundle up the flax and carry that, hoping to take that back so they can make linen. But then they come across some linen cloth. And one of them says, oh, let's put down the flax, let's take the linen instead. And the other one says, no, I've been carrying this flax around and I put so much energy into bundling it up, I think I'll carry this instead. So he holds on to the flax while the other man drops the flax and takes the linen. And they find things of increasing value as they go through the, the village. They finally come across gold. And the first man says, well, look, this is what we wanted the flax for to be in, was to get some gold. This is much more valuable. So he takes the gold, but the other man says, no, I'm content to carry the flax. Most of us are like that second man. We've got our things that we hold on to. Good or bad, we don't know, but we've, they've been with us for so long we don't want to change anything. That gets us nowhere. We've got the ability to adjust the mind, to look at the mind and adjust the mind. And it's all for the sake of our own happiness, our own well-being. To try to take advantage of these teachings. Therefore, your own good. 